Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. With your host, Linnea Hubbard. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. I'm Linnea Hubbard and today is Friday, March 17th, 2023. It's been 3,306 days since Russia occupied Crimea on February 27, 2014, and 387 days since the large-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Today's podcast looks at what happened yesterday in the Russia-Ukraine war. The Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from direct contacts in Ukraine and their proxies, Russian Ministry of Defense reports, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reports, Operational Commands North, South, and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geolocation experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian mill bloggers and social media accounts with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, to report the truth, because the truth matters. Let's start with our assessment of the current status of the war. First, we maintain that Russian forces are experiencing a critical shortage of anti-tank guided missiles and man-portable anti-tank weapons. Second, we maintain that Russian forces are experiencing non-precision artillery munition shortages theater-wide and that multiple intelligence sources have validated our March 13, 2023 assessment. Third, We maintain that the Ukrainian defense of Bakhmut has reached a critical state. Fourth, we maintain that Russia no longer has the resources to cause catastrophic economic, social, or military disruptions by targeting Ukraine's electrical infrastructure. Fifth, we maintain that Russia can no longer tap its strategic reserve of caliber cruise missiles and can only launch its monthly production of 25 to 30 missiles. Sixth, We maintain that there is a risk of a nuclear accident due to the de-energization of Ukraine's electrical grid as long as the Russian Ministry of Defense, or MOD, continues to target Ukraine's power industry. Seventh, we maintain that the Russian Federation armed forces are combat ineffective and are only capable of effective attacks on a small area of the front, such as Bakhmut. Eighth, We maintain that short of using chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear, or seaburn, weapons, the Russian military will continue doing everything possible to capture Bakhmut, regardless of the cost. Ninth, we maintain that Russia has committed almost all available ground forces to Ukraine and cannot maintain the current level of personnel and equipment losses. Tenth, We maintain that the public infighting between private military company or PMC Wagner Group's leader Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Russian MOD has reached a dangerous level that threatens to derail the only successful Russian offensive operation since June 2022 in Bakhmut. Eleventh, we maintain that the Russian MOD is actively working to eliminate the influence of PMC Wagner Group and Yevgeny Prigozhin both on and off the battlefield. Twelfth, we maintain that the Kremlin is actively attempting to topple the legitimate government of Moldova. And finally, we maintain that the Kremlin is also actively interfering with the Georgian government's attempt to join the European Union. One year ago yesterday, on March 16, 2022, we assessed, quote, logistics, supplies, and losses of field officers, ground troops, and equipment are limiting gain to the Donetsk Oblast, end quote. Ukrainian forces launched a counteroffensive west of Kyiv and in the Mykolaiv Oblast. Odessa was hit by caliber cruise missiles and shelled by the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Russian forces intensified their terror campaign in Kharkiv, focusing on civilian targets, and Russian forces reached the outskirts of Izum. Ivan Fedorov, the mayor of Melitopol, was returned to Ukraine in the first prisoner swap of the expanded war. At the time, he was reportedly rescued in a special forces raid. The Russian Air Force bombed the drama theater and the Neptune public pool in Mariupol. 
Weeks later, it would be estimated that up to 600 people were killed at the drama theater. The Associated Press shared horrifying photos from inside Mariupol's last functioning hospital. Russian Major General Oleg Mityev was killed in combat, which started a string of violent reprisals against Mariupol civilians. Fighting west of Severodonetsk and Popozna continued, and Panama reported that the Russian Navy attacked three cargo ships registered to the Central American nation, including the cargo ship Helt, which sank on March 3rd. Let's get some regional updates, starting with Kharkiv. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, and the Russian MOD reported that fighting for control of Khryanikivka continued. Kharkiv Oblast Administrative and Military Governor Ole Sinyubov reported that Ukrainian forces held their defensive lines. And that's all I've got. So, moving on to the Donbass region in Luhansk. Former Luhansk Oblast Administrative and Military Governor Serhii Khaidai said there had been a significant increase in Russian artillery fire over the last few days, but consumption had impacted logistics. A lull in fighting was not due to chronic ammunition shortages, but temporary transportation issues. Russian mercenary mill blogger Rybar provided additional confirmation, writing, quote, The situation in the Svatovsky section remains relatively calm. The armed forces of Ukraine are taking advantage of the operational pause and are strengthening their forward positions. End quote. In the Svatova operational area, the GSAFU and the Russian MOD reported that Novoselivsky was shelled. In the Kremina operational area, Russian mercenary mill blogger Worgonzo repeated its claim that Russian troops were attempting to advance on Lakivka. Worgonzo also reported continued fighting near Nevsky, while the Russian MOD only reported artillery shelling. Fighting continued in the forests around Kremina and near Kuzmina. Videos showed Russia and Ukraine each lost an armored vehicle within 200 meters of Dibrova, and the Russian MOD reported Ukrainian forces were shelled. We did not adjust the map because the line of conflict is basically constantly moving in the Serebriansky woods, but based on combat reports, it appears Ukrainian forces made marginal gains in the last 24 hours. In the Lysychansk operational area, fighting for control of Bilohorivka, the one in Luhansk, continued with no change in the situation. In northeast Donetsk, in the Siversk operational area, Russian forces restarted attacks on Verknokomyanske and continued attacks on the eastern edge of Spirna. In the Bakhmut operational area, Fighting was still intense, but lighter than the previous three to five days, with both combatants likely reconstituting forces and moving up reserves. Russian and Ukrainian field commanders continued to complain about their respective ammunition shortages. Some assessment here. Russian forces have used short operational pauses to bring fresh reserves to the front since May of 2022, when they attacked Popazna in Luhansk. In our assessment... PMC Wagner and the Russian MOD are preparing to launch another wave of significant attacks in the next 24 to 72 hours. Some of the toughest battles are for control of Orikhovo Vasilivka, with no change in the situation. PMC Wagner's attempts to advance on Bogdanivka were unsuccessful. There were social media claims that Russian aligned mercenaries made incremental gains in the direction of Hryurivka but Wagner didn't make supporting reports. Fighting in the area of the Azov metal factory complex continued, as well as street fighting in Bakhmut, where gains and losses are measured in houses occupied per day. The line of conflict is in a state of flux. Russian sources repeated the same claims made for over a week of almost reaching where the MiG-17 statue was and being near or reaching Korsunskoho Street. Honestly, these statements are likely not disinformation, with Russian forces periodically reaching these areas and then being pushed back. There continues to be circumstantial evidence that Russian forces are critically low on anti-tank guided missiles, or ATGMs, and man-portable anti-tank weapons. Ukraine shared a video of a Russian BMP-2 destroyed by a Ukrainian Stuhna PM ATGM. 
Ukraine also shared a video showing a BTR-4 infantry fighting vehicle, or IFV, firing on a Russian armored vehicle and troop position at close range with impunity. Fighting was reported near Ivanivske with no change in the situation. Kostyantinivka was heavily shelled by Russian Uragan and Tornado S rockets fired by multiple launch rocket systems, or MLRS, using cluster munitions. Six people were injured, including a foreign volunteer. The attack targeted civilian areas, damaging a school, five high-rise apartment buildings, and 20 homes. In Kramatorsk, a nurse and a civilian volunteer with the Ukrainian Territorial Defense were arrested by the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, and are accused of being Russian spies. Text message exchanges on their phones, shared by the SBU, showed they were collecting intelligence on the locations and movements of Ukrainian troops and sharing it with the Russian Federal Security Service, or FSB. In southwest Donetsk, Ukrainian Brigadier General Oleksandr Tarnovsky said the fiercest fighting occurred in the Avdiivka, Marinka, and Volkhedar operational areas. In the Avdiivka operational area, there is significant fog of war north of the city, with conflicting intelligence from typically reliable and semi-reliable sources. Our favorite FSB colonel, convicted war criminal, Kremlin pariah, and failed Mobik Igor Strelkov Girkin, wrote that Novobakhmutivka is a no-man's land, which repeatedly switches which combatant is in control. He added that currently, Russian forces hold the town. Girkin was emphatic that Krasnohorivka was not under Russian control. The GSAFU reported that an attack in the direction of Stepova was repulsed. Just adding to the fog of war, Girkin claimed that Kamyanka was captured, while the GSAFU and Wargonzo reported continued fighting. Okay, assessment here. We significantly expanded the area of uncertainty through this region and moved the line of conflict to the eastern edge of Krasnohorivka. In our assessment, we don't believe that any one source is intentionally misrepresenting the situation. The situation is fluid, with defensive positions repeatedly swapped in positional battles multiple times a day. Russian forces continued their attempts to advance on Avdiivka with no change in the situation. Ukrainian forces captured four Mobiks with the 2nd Battalion of the 110th Motor Rifle Brigade, including three from the Orenburg region. They were among the Mobiks who, earlier this month, appealed to Russian President Vladimir Putin to be transferred away from the front lines. And I guess getting captured by Ukrainian troops is a pretty good way to do that. The 1st Army Corps, formerly of the DNR, continued attacks west of Vodiana along the northern edge of Pervomaiske while also attacking from Piski. With Russian sources reporting attacks on Pervomaiske from the east, we disagree with other analysts who have assessed the village as captured. Fighting near Sieverne continued, and an attack on Netailova was repulsed. Russian forces retreated further from Nevelske after another failed attack that caused heavy casualties. Okay, more assessment. We also expanded the area of uncertainty here due to the inconsistent claims on territorial control. We also believe that no one is intentionally reporting misinformation in this region, and it is more likely that the line of conflict is swinging 500 to 1,500 meters a day in either direction. In the Marinka operational area, fighting continued in the remains of Marinka, with no change in the situation. Russian forces reportedly made gains to the north of what was the city center, but we already had that area assessed as under Russian control. In the Vukhledar operational area, fighting, described as intense, continued in the area of the Mikilsk Dachas. Russian forces continued to suffer significant losses while making no territorial gains. The Russian MOD did not report fighting and claimed activity was limited to artillery and airstrikes. A video from Ukrainian forces demonstrated what Russian troops do best, reduce civilian areas to rubble. As with most of the photos and videos we reference here on the podcast, we do link to it in our full situation report on Patreon. In Russian-occupied Maloyanisol, 
an explosion followed by secondaries was reported on social media. Residents in Mariupol chattered about the sounds of air defense and secondary blasts. Moving on to Zaporizhia. Rybar claimed that a Ukrainian DRG unit was operating in the area of Vasilivka and came under fire by Russian troops. We cannot verify the claim, and there weren't any supporting claims from a second source. There was also no update on the status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. In the Black Sea, Crimea, Mykolaiv, and Odessa region, Operational Command South, or OCS, reported 21 vessels of the Black Sea Fleet were on patrol, including three frigates and two Kilo-class submarines capable of launching up to 32-caliber cruise missiles in total. Fun fact, among the flotilla is the oldest active-duty naval vessel on the planet, the Kamuna Recovery Vessel, built in 1913. There was also an additional warship on patrol in the Azov Sea. The Black Sea Fleet continued to use a search-and-rescue pattern while seeking out debris from a United States MQ-9 Reaper drone. In western and central Ukraine, Russian and Ukrainian forces traded artillery across the Dnipro River. In the city of Kherson, a kamikaze drone attacked an outpatient clinic, tossing cars like toys in the courtyard. Incredibly, there were no injuries. On March 15th, shelling damaged the steam lines from the thermal plant, cutting off heat to parts of Kherson for the second time in six weeks. To the north, Bereslav was struck by mortars fired from the east bank of the Dnipro. In north and northeast Ukraine, rolling power outages continued in Kyiv's Sviatoshinsky, Shevchenkivsky, and Solomyansky districts, with demand exceeding electrical production. On the Russian front in Bilgorod, air defense was reportedly active again, with local officials claiming, quote, several missiles were shot down. In Rostov-on-Don, the FSB Border Service headquarters exploded and was consumed by fire. A security camera caught the very moment the building exploded. According to the Ministry of Emergency Situations, a power cable caught fire in the weapons warehouse Employees tried to put the fire out independently, but the flame spread to tanks holding 10 tons of fuel. Video of the initial blast and fire does not support the claim there was a hydrocarbon fire. Security forces reported that ammunition, paint, and varnish stored in the building cooked off, hampering efforts to extinguish the blaze. One person was killed and two injured. In Oryol Kursk, a person reported he saw a Volkswagen Amarok pickup truck with Ukrainian plates and two men and one woman dressed in Ukrainian military uniforms. An alert was announced with authorities looking for the alleged Ukrainian DRG unit. After tracking the pickup down, federal police learned that the man who made the original claim was involved in a road rage incident earlier in the day and submitted a fake report to get revenge. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers, and analysts is funded by readers, listeners, and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Let's talk about developments theater-wide and outside Ukraine. The United States released a declassified video that shows a Russian Su-27 dumping fuel on an MQ-9 Reaper surveillance drone during a dangerously close flyby. As the Pentagon reported, the first pass damaged the propeller, with the video showing one blade was badly bent. The Su-27 makes a second pass and appears to strike the drone with its belly, resulting in signal loss. Russia claims they've located the wreckage in 900 meters of water. A U.S. official told the American news network CNN that recovery efforts had only found some bits of fiberglass. Donald Trump Jr. shared his hot take on Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's March 15th statement of the downing of the MQ-9, focusing on Austin's use of the words, quote, reckless, environmentally unsound, and unprofessional manner, end quote. 
Trump Jr. wrote, quote, environmentally unsound. That's what they're worried about, not the start of World War III, end quote. Assessment here. Ignoring the World War III Kremlin talking point, when the Pentagon stated environmentally unsound, they didn't mean pity the poor dolphins of the Black Sea who had MQ-9 chunks fall from the sky. Though the war has been awfully rough on those dolphins, and I'm pretty sure they're endangered. The point is, environmentally unsound is a military term for expressing the operational environment. Calling the pilot's actions environmentally unsound is the formal military way of saying the Russian pilot acted like an idiot in an operational environment where mistakes could be incredibly costly. Vadim Skibitsky, a representative of the main intelligence directorate of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GUR, said that the frequency of missile attacks on Ukraine would likely decline, saying, quote, We note that the strike last time used about 30 cruise missiles. This is the amount that Russia can produce in a month. If before they could strike every week, now we see maybe once a month, and in the future it may be less. End quote. Quick assessment. This aligns with our earlier assessment that Russian forces could only launch what they can produce, having reached into their strategic reserve. Battalion Commander Anatoly Kupol Kozel of the 46th Brigade refused to accept a demotion and resigned from his commission after giving an interview to the Washington Post. Kozel told the U.S. newspaper that his entire battalion was comprised of replacement troops who were poorly trained. Valentin Shevchenko, a spokesperson for the air assault forces of the armed forces of Ukraine, said, quote, An internal investigation was conducted into the dissemination of false information in an interview by an air assault forces officer. It was established that the servicemen had violated a number of guidelines on public communication and the disclosure of information constituting a state secret. In accordance with the standards of NATO armies, which have been implemented in the armed forces of Ukraine, permission for a serviceman to communicate with the media must be granted by their commanding officer, which did not happen. End quote. Kozel was demoted for his actions from the post of Combat Battalion Commander of the 46th Air Mobile Brigade to Deputy Battalion Commander of the Training Center. Unrelated to the Kozel resignation, a Ukrainian junior lieutenant at the 190th Education Center in Huiva Zhitomir has been placed into military custody after he beat a conscript at a Ukrainian military training center. He is accused of exceeding his official authority, committed under martial law, and suspended from duty. If convicted, he could face up to 12 years in prison. The SBU broke up three groups organizing border crossings to evade military service. Men seeking to leave were charged as much as $9,000 to transit illegally out of Ukraine. Russian social media mocked the news, apparently forgetting the estimated 800,000 Russian citizens who fled Russia to avoid conscription and mobilization. Dropping in a quick content warning, some members of the Muslim faith may find this next section offensive. Russia is accused of releasing fake propaganda videos alleging Ukrainian troops are defiling the Quran. In one video, a person you never see wearing Ukrainian pixel camo uses a Quran as a cutting board for slicing salo. Salo is uncooked smoked pork belly and is popular among Eastern Europeans and Russians. The second video is even more bizarre. Hooded figures whose faces are never shown and who don't have correct uniform insignia are sitting by an already prepared fire. A third person in the same uniform dumps a plastic shopping bag of Qurans on the ground. Someone picks one up, tears some pages out, and places them in the fire. Okay, assessment. We cannot determine the veracity of the videos, but we have real doubts about the second one. We find it pretty unlikely that a Ukrainian soldier was in Chechnya, bought a bag of Qurans, and is walking around the battlefield with a shopping bag of perfect and brand new Qurans for kindling. Russia has definitely improved from presenting three copies of the video game The Sims as proof of spy efforts, but they still need to try harder. Ukraine's first female explosive ordnance disposal, or EOD, expert has entered service with the Territorial Guard. 
So after 54 weeks of talking, it finally happened. Polish President Andrzej Duda announced that his nation was transferring at least 16 MiG-29s to Ukraine, with the first four to be delivered in a matter of days. The MiGs are being replaced by new South Korean F-50 fighter planes, which will be delivered to Poland by the end of 2023. On March 16th, the commander of the Air Forces of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Lt. Gen. Mykola Oleschuk, took part in the Symposium of Air Force Commanders of NATO member countries. Oleschuk asked the group to accelerate efforts to provide Ukraine with multi-role fourth-generator fighter aircraft, both for ground support and to help intercept Russian missile attacks on civilians. He recommended that a joint coordinated group of partners can smooth out the process following the tank and naval coalition's format. Okay, more assessment. The transfer of Polish MiG-29s has likely broken the taboo of providing combat aircraft to Ukraine. We expect to see a series of announcements over the next 60 to 75 days. Speaking of taboo, let's talk about the Russian military and mobilization. On March 15th, PMC Wagner leader Yevgeny Prigozhin gave a fiery interview claiming that the Russian MOD cut his ammunition supply to prevent Wagner from capturing Bakhmut because, quote, Solidar was enough, end quote. During the interview, Prigozhin claimed his secure Russian military ERA cell phone was taken away, leaving no way for him to communicate with the Kremlin or senior commanders. Quick sidebar, we've assessed that Russia's ammunition shortage is somewhat artificial and frustrating for Russian military leaders who have been used to unlimited amounts of non-precision munitions. We dug through the archives and found a compilation of Russian MLRS barrages from February 25th to March 9th, 2022. It has been months since we've seen artillery attacks on this scale or artillery units tightly clustered in an open area. When you're used to firing 60,000 artillery shells a day, and now you can only fire 25,000, you'll perceive there is a terrible and unfair ammunition shortage. The real problem is that Russian military leaders need to change their tactics. The Kremlin stepped up its information war against Prigozhin, indicating that the infighting is reaching a breaking point and is likely impacting offensive operations. The opposition resource Russian Crime claimed with documentation that Prigozhin is not the head of PMC Wagner, but a puppet of the Russian government. The researchers claim the real leaders of Wagner Group are the head of the main intelligence directorate, or GRU, of the general staff of the Russian Federation, Igor Kostyukov, and Putin's former bodyguard, Alexei Dumin. All decisions on PMCs must be approved by Dumin, who gives orders to Prigozhin, who is a junior business partner. It's believed that Dumin controls Prigozhin's fake opposition, giving him the status of an unofficial leader, which allows him to do the dirty work of the GRU and curry influence in different parts of the world, such as Africa. It gets worse. The Russian state media-approved newspaper Nyeze Vizemaya Gazeta claimed the head of the Security Council of the Russian Federation, Nikolai Patrushev, in an address to Putin, suggested that at the current pace of the war in Ukraine, there would be nothing left of Wagner Group in six to eight weeks. Patrushev also suggested that because of the situation, Prigozhin may try to unite former and remaining active Wagner fighters in an admittedly far-fetched plot to organize, arm, and send loyal mercenaries to seize power in the federal regions that border Ukraine. The secretary of the Security Council said that he had already ordered to control the contacts and movements of former PMC Wagner fighters. Putin agreed with Patrushev's arguments and thanked him for the work done to neutralize PMC Wagner in general and Yevgeny Prigozhin in particular. End quote. Some more assessment. For a Russian audience, it doesn't matter if these two claims oppose each other. I mean, a puppet can't run an attempt to overthrow the Russian government. These efforts are being put in the public sphere to discredit Prigozhin as a so-called turbo-patriot, capable of marching through Russia with his loyal fighters, while also being a mindless puppet controlled by the GRU. These are classic authoritarian and fascist talking points. 
where an enemy of the state is simultaneously all-powerful and helpless. This is definitely the most dramatic escalation in the war of words between the Kremlin and PMC Wagner. Russian state media journalist Roman Saponkov reported that the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs said the paperwork for the three vehicles confiscated by OMON were forgeries. Russian state media agency Mia Media reported that a second review of the registration documents for his vehicles was scheduled, but the initial results claimed the provided paperwork was a forgery. All is going to plan. In our War Crimes and Human Rights segment, in our War Crimes and Human Rights segment, we discuss events that might be upsetting to hear about. There is some graphic detail in today's report. Please feel free to skip ahead to the next segment. Timestamps are in the description. A United Nations investigative body said Russia had committed numerous war crimes in Ukraine, such as willful killings and torture. Crimes include making children watch relatives being raped, detainment adjacent to dead bodies, and forced deportations without their parents or guardians. The report identified the Russian attacks on Ukraine's critical civilian infrastructure and its use of torture as possibly rising to so-called crimes against humanity. Asked whether Russia's acts might amount to genocide, as Ukraine believes, a UN representative said it had not yet found such evidence, but would continue its investigation. Human rights activist Anastasia Pantaleeva spoke about the conditions in SIZO No. 2 in Simferopol, occupied Crimea, where Russian forces are illegally holding Ukrainians kidnapped from occupied Kherson and Zaporizhia. Ukrainian prisoners are isolated, beaten, and take mandatory walks in thin clothing during cold weather. In occupied Henechesk in Kherson, Russian forces are carrying out reprisals on the civilian population, conducting searches of homes and electronics, and taking fingerprints and photographs of residents, according to Vladislav Nazarov, a spokesperson for OCS. In geopolitical news, The Economist released a list of the top ten nations most closely aligned with Russia's geopolitics. In order from most to least, Belarus, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Syria, China, Venezuela, Nicaragua, India, and Uzbekistan. Any surprises in there for you? Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine shot down a Chinese commercial drone made by Mugen Limited. Company officials confirmed to the United States news agency CNN that the debris was one of their products and said they were, quote, extremely sad that their drone had been weaponized, adding, quote, we do not approve of the use. We are doing everything possible to stop it, end quote. Mugin has previously blocked the sale of its drones to Ukraine and Russia, but that doesn't prevent third-party straw purchases. Politico reported that in 2022, several Chinese companies sent up to a 1,000 assault rifles, parts for drones, and body armor to Russia for use in Ukraine. Some assessment here. This is such a small amount of equipment. Whether these were direct sales or straw purchases through a third party is unclear. U.S. Congressperson Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, said, You know what? Never mind. You, you can Google it. I, I don't really need to give her another platform. In economic news, the sale of all goods in Russia declined in 2022, except for alcohol. Okay, that's not a surprise at all. At the end of the war year, sales of food products decreased by 2.4% in physical terms and non-food products by 5.8%. At the same time, alcohol sales increased in terms of rubles spent, 11.2%, and total liters purchased, 0.7%. Demand for hard liquor increased sharply, with the sale of vodka up 2.4%. Assessment here. A 2.4% reduction in food purchases hints that Russia's population declined by 3.3 million in 2022. Up to 800,000 people fled to escape authoritarianism and mobilization, and by some estimates, 
over 100,000 have been killed in action. Up to 350,000 are mobilized in Ukraine and are fed, at least partially, by the Russian Ministry of Defense. As for the other 2 million unaccounted for, belt-tightening black market purchases of sanction skating imports and home gardening likely accounts for the displaced spending. The ruble held at an exchange rate of 77 for one U.S. dollar. West Texas Intermediate, or WTI, crude stabilized after the worst price drop of 2023. WTI traded at $69 a barrel, and Brent rose to 75. Russian Urals crude was still battered, rising to an official price of $49 a barrel. The United States wholesale Arbob gasoline traded at $2.53 a gallon or 67 cents a liter on the spot market. Dutch TTF natural gas futures remained stable, with April and May contracts rising to 44 euros per megawatt hour. Chicago SRW wheat futures climbed to $7.07 a bushel for May 2023 delivery. And that's what we know. Join me again tomorrow for more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.